visiting long lasting high star children. He is heavily, heavily involved with family and veteran support groups, advocating the women's support coverage and veteran care that plays the Bosnian, Kosovo, Afghanistan, and Iraq. The main part of the served in Afghanistan during 2004, working throughout the country training Afghan soldiers and civilians in construction management. While in the country, his team of combat engineers constructed multiple structures, including two maximum security prisons and hostile areas. The main part of the Armstrong that are close to the Corps of Engineers in Kabul area and assisted in the construction of multiple facilities for Afghan National Army. The main part of the team of engineers supervised the solicitation to the presidential house in the Command Sergeant Major entered the Army in 1973. His 41 year career began as an Army Colonel in the 1st Battalion of the 123rd Army. Starting through multiple duty assignments, culminating with the first Sergeant of HHC, 3rd Battalion, 123rd Army, at Fort Knox, Kentucky. Prior to becoming the same Command Sergeant Major, he was assigned by Garrison Command Sergeant Major of the Little Ford Regional Training Center in Randall, Kentucky. He was a facility engineer. At the center involved in the development and construction of the Kentucky National Guard Premier Training Facility. Command Sergeant Major Armstrong has been involved in multiple phases of growth, starting forward center, starting with the initial 29 acres in 1979, then currently exceeding 12,000 acres of the new display and is a major training facility capable of providing housing, training, and sustainment to the brigade of South Korea. The Women Forward Center employs over 200 state contracting federal full-time employees. The main Sergeant Major and his wife Laura had one son, Staff Sergeant Ed Armstrong, and a daughter, Mom Kendall, and a granddaughter, Katie. The Armstrong family resides in Randall, Kentucky. Boys strongly indicating a warm welcome to the main Sergeant Major Armstrong. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank What a wonderful job. What a wonderful rendition of the Star Spangled Banner. And, uh, it's our custom in the Army to give challenge points to those that do wonderful things, to serve those that serve others, and that overcome many things that, uh, uh, such as singing in front of this large, wonderful crowd today. It's my honor to uh, accept the speech, accept the opportunity to speak today from uh, Lieutenant Colonel Latham, sir, my pleasure. This is a wonderful veteran ceremony, and uh, certainly I'm a small part of a big, big celebration and recognition, recognition of uh, some wonderful men and women today. I would like to make a comment that it's my honor to be among these many dignitaries, special veterans in here from World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Desert Storm, the Global War on Terror, Enduring Freedom, and Iraqi Freedom. It is such a warm, uh, Great opportunity. I'd like to give another round of applause for all of our veterans here.
Those veterans encompass many different kinds of people. Those who serve our country in many diverse ways. They represent the best of America. This includes the brave men and women serving today in our armed forces. It also includes our National Guard and Reserve Soldiers. America's sons and daughters who serve are not victims to be pitied. They are men and women of character who continue to believe in this country and enough to put life and limb on the line without qualification and without thought of personal gain. The comforting news for every American is that our men and women in uniform are as good today as in any in our history. As good as their heroic, underappreciated, and large, largely abandoned fathers and uncles who were in Vietnam and their grandfathers who were in Korea in World War II. They have the same steel in their backs and have made their own mark, immortalizing forever places like Ramadi, Fallujah, Baghdad, and Iraq, and the Helmut and St. Gideon province in Afghanistan. They're now part of the U.S. military legend and stand just as proudly alongside Iwo Jima, Normandy, Inchon, Way City, Quezon, the Delta, and Asia Valley in Vietnam. We should also take comfort in the fact that these young Americans are not born killers, but are good and decent young men and women. And for over 10 years, they performed remarkable acts of bravery and selflessness for a cause they have decided is bigger and more important than themselves. I would say that we should have no doubt that they are the finest of their generation. Like those who went before them in uniform, we owe them everything. We owe them our safety. We owe them our prosperity. We owe them our freedom. We owe them our life. We owe them our future. This day is observed around the world and is known many names. Armistice Day, Remembrance Day, and others. It once was a celebration of the silencing of the cannons of World War I. Now it marks a day when nations around the world pause in a moment of silence with solemn pride and remembrance of heroism of those who have served. Those who are currently serving and those who died in our country's service. We do not mark this day each year as a celebration of victory, but rather as a celebration of those who make victory possible. It's a day during which we keep in our minds the great men and women of this young nation, generations of them, who above all else believed in and fought for a set of ideals. We keep the story of their sacrifice alive throughout our memories. Not only did they hold these beliefs high above their own goals and ideals, but they also laid aside their jobs, their comfortable homes, their lives, as well as their own personal security, so that many more citizens of this country could regain a sense of security in the aftermath of terrorism striking in the early 21st century. They also exemplified the citizen soldier and citizen airman of today's dollar and our sister service. Our reserve forces today have been able to transition from the working force to the fighting force with grace and resilience, able to take a myriad of challenges throughout the nation and the world. These young men and women chose to serve a cause that is greater than self. Men who can serve stood forward after they knew they'd be sent to harm's way. Today is an all-volunteer service. 
in this time of persistent combat, combat conflict, and for the better part of this decade, we've been in constant war. They've endured tour after tour in distant, difficult places. Kentucky Army Guard has 7,540 Army soldiers. There are 1,240 Air Guards in, in Louisville. We're just shy of 20,000 20, mobilization. And when we do the math, some of them at least 2.5 times per person. Many of our young men and women have deployed in arms way as many as four times, some more. Our Guard and Reserve members continue to heed the call and respond to the cries of the world and our own citizens. These young people stand out as our friends and neighbors in our communities, the teachers, the lawyers, the truck driver, the sheriff's deputy, and or the tax advisor. And those who don't stand on the sideline. They've all volunteered to train, to sacrifice, and perform under pressure whenever and wherever needed. They're more ready and relevant than before. A life of service is anything but peaceful. When military members deploy, they can be filled with emotional tear and sorrow for the discussion of what will happen during the future actions before the soldier airmen can return home. And I say soldier airmen, Sabre and Marine, which served together on many of these drugs. When disaster strikes, and the call comes to help others in our community, even though disaster is at home, whatever the circumstances, they keep their commitment to always be ready, always there for you, for a fellow citizen. Today our armed forces find themselves in a strategic infliction point. In the years ahead we must transition from combat operations, adjust to new physical realities, and prepare to face a new and challenging security environment both at home and abroad. Taken together, these are no small tasks. Successfully adapting to the future will be important. This is paramount for the future of our states and our country, the great nation. We must also continue to keep faith with our force, our families, and our neighbors. We must continue to honor our fallen patriots and wounded warriors by supporting our families and helping them reintegrate into their communities. Veterans, both past and current, I would ask that each one of the veterans in here please stand. To this day, to the fallen and their families, there is no tribute, no commemoration, no praise that can truly match the magnitude of your service and your sacrifice. We can but offer a humble moment of silence. Ladies and gentlemen, I ask that you also now stand with our veterans. To all of our veterans, all of you, we say thank you. Colonel Latham, thank you very much for hosting me today. It's been my honor, my privilege, and what a great, great. Uh, environment that you've created today. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you.
the result was that Smith called America and what would eventually be better known as Mount Country Disease. Smith's words invoked the history of America as well as its beauty and sensitiveness as a blessing. America soon took on a lot of its own, quickly becoming wildly young and well loved, and the song served as an unofficial national anthem of the United States for 100 years until the Star Spangled Banner was adopted as the official national anthem in 1931. The song was first performed on July 4, 1831, by a children's choir in Boston to commemorate Independence Day. Today, it will be performed by the OCHS band in acknowledgement of the selfless service of our community special generation. Thank you very much.
November 1919, President Wilson proclaimed November 11th as the first commemoration of Armistice Day with the following words. To us in America, the reflections on Armistice Day will be filled with solemn pride and heroism of those who died in the country's service and with gratitude for the victory. In 1938, Congress passed an act to make the 11th of November each year a legal holiday, a day dedicated to the cause of world peace and to be thereafter celebrated and known as Armistice Day. Armistice Day was primarily a day dedicated to honor veterans of World War I, but in 1954, after World War II had required the greatest mobilization of soldiers, sailors, Marines, and airmen in the nation's history, and after America's forces had fought aggression in Korea, Congress moved the act of 1934 by striking out the word armistice and replacing it with the word veterans. With the approval of this legislation in 1954, November 11th became the day to honor American veterans of all wars. While for the last year or so we no longer had any surviving veterans of the First World War, we we're very fortunate that a number of World War II veterans do still remain with us. And we have some of those here with us today. The men and women who served overseas and at home during World War II have come to be known as the greatest generation. And it's very difficult to imagine what our society would be like today, if not for their courage, their resourcefulness, and most importantly, their unwavering commitment to our ideals. Again, we're very privileged to have representatives with us today, and I'd ask, please, that our World War II veterans and the spouses of our World War II veterans, please either stand or raise your hands to be recognized. that we don't have that we should have. 
When I retired in 2010, I've got 25 odd years in the Army. My wife got a piece of paper just the same as I did, recognizing uh, the sacrifices she had made in the course of that 25 years or so. Uh, thinking back after the call period from 1999 to 2005, I deployed five times in six years, and I missed a lot of birthdays, Christmases, Thanksgiving, anniversaries, you name it. Uh, and she's the one that kept the home car for her the whole time. Never a word of complaint. Rarely a word of complaint. But she was a fantastic lady. And I think anybody who served in uniform would agree that without the, without the support of their spouses, we could not do the things that we do. So if you are here, and if you are the husband or wife of a veteran, Please stand, because this is your day two. On your feet.
Now, if I can have the supervisor's teams of the hospital middle school, please to give our civil veterans one final round of applause. And thank you all. Thank you. 